fill in today for, for Pastor Sam. And um, I just want you to know that uh, we had, my wife and I, I've been a military chaplain for about uh, it's almost 30 years, and we looked around for a church when we retired here in Williamsburg. And this is the place we selected because uh, mainly because of Pastor Sam and because of uh, his wife, Myra. We have been blessed through the year, the year and a half that we've been here. And I got to tell you, Sam and Myra embody being a pastor. Uh, if I was going to look up the word pastor in the dictionary, I think I'd see a picture of Sam and Myra in there. They are such a blessing. Uh, if you're looking for a church, I can't speak more highly about any other church besides this one. They are really uh, do a lot for the, for the church, and they're very approachable and extending. And we, my wife and I, Kathleen, have been blessed by that. Um, I want to talk to you today about community. Next week, I'll be here again. I'll be speaking on fearless faith. How many of you probably need a little bit of bolster, boostering of your faith, right? Uh, especially in a time like this, when we live in an, an, in an environment of fear, where we're struck with this COVID thing that never seems to end, and it's frustrating, and what can we do about it? Well, um, God has some ways to, to implement his faith in us that will overcome any fears that we have. And so I want you to join me next week as we talk about the ways that God can give us faith that overcomes any fear that you struggle with. And uh, in a very practical sermon, I think you'll find some of the steps that we take uh, very profitable. Look forward to seeing you next week online. And for a few of you, be here at, in, in body here in the church. I want to talk to you, first of all, about what the church is about. And, um, you know, I think Melanie used the word bummer. You know, it is a bummer not to have people in this sanctuary but it can be discouraging, but I want to emphatically mention that being church is not the building. The church is the body of Christ. It's you and I. The word in Greek is called ekklesia. It means the called out ones. And we are called out for a purpose. Even though we can't assemble here right now for the next couple of weeks, we're still the church. And the idea behind that is we are called out to minister to the world that there are a lot of people that are really struggling, particularly now with, the, with this, co this COVID thing that just never seems to end, and, uh, and, and they don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we want to make sure that uh, we give them a little fresh bread and a little new wine and share with them about the message of Jesus Christ. Because our job is to plunder hell and populate heaven. We want to take as many people with us through conversion as we possibly can. And so the church comes in there, and we should never lose sight of the vision. That's our vision, is to minister out there to our community, and it is absolutely vital that we see that. And the way we do that, I'm going to read three scriptures very quickly here. The first one is in 1 Corinthians 1.10. You should be able to see that on the board in just a moment. 1 Corinthians 1.10, and it says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you, that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. The concept is unity. One team, one fight. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, Paul says to the church at Ephesus, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Once again, you see that this goes on throughout the Bible. Scriptures that talk about being unified and as a team. Even Jesus he himself said in, in uh, John chapter 17, verse 20, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you and me are, uh, and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. How important that is, that we understand that God wants us to be unified as a team. And we do that, there's nothing we can't possibly overcome. Let's pray now as we're going to talk about how community plays into that. Father, this morning I am grateful for the opportunity I have to minister the word here to this congregation, both present and uh, those that are distant, uh, at a distance through Skype and through Facebook. I pray, Lord, that you would use me, that you would provide, as Jehovah Jireh, a good word that's applicable to our lives. 
Open our hearts, open our, our ears that we might hear your word, open our hearts that we might apply it. I pray, Lord, that everybody here would see much more of you and much less of me as you speak through me. And I pray, Father, that we would leave here knowing that you've spoken to us. I pray, Lord, you'd help me so I can help us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, when I think of community, I think of the fact that uh, John Dunn once said, he said, no man is an island separate to himself. We were not made that way to be an island. In fact, my first church that I pastored as the senior pastor was in the South. And I'll never forget uh, my southern deacons in the church took me to a real southern restaurant for breakfast. And as we were, the waitress was going around taking the orders, she was asking people what they wanted, got to me, and she said, honey, would you like grits with that? I said, well, I've never had grits before. Why don't you just bring me one and I'll taste them to make sure that I like it before I order a bunch of them. She laughed, and I tell you, my deacons were rolling on the floor laughing about this Yankee idiot that didn't know what grits were. And so she's laughing, and she says this. She said, honey, with that southern accent, you can cut with a knife. Honey, grits don't come by themselves. They come in community. And I discovered that's true. And, you know, human beings are a lot like grits. You know, you didn't, you know, you didn't become who you were on your own. You are who you are because people touched you in your life. Neighbors, friends. Parents, parents, acquaintances, teachers. And also, uh, this community of people for, for that, that community of people you carry around inside you, some of them touched you for the better, and some of them touched you for the, for the worse and, and did some damage. And oh, by the way, you also touch people in your life through people like people that have been your friends through life, people that have been, uh, uh, you know, perhaps acquaintances in school or at work. And through all of that, you've done things, embraced some people and built them up. And in other, way, in other ways, perhaps some of those people have been hurt by you. Your life and your actions will touch all kinds of human beings. But the point I'm trying to make here is you didn't get here on your own. And neither did anybody else in this room and neither did anybody else that's online. We got here because of a community of people that spoke to us and ministered to us. So God has made us, in a way, in fact, with the first human being, Adam, he said, you know, it's not good for man to live in isolation. I'm going to provide Eve. I'm going to provide other human beings so we can have community. It's one of the first things God was thought was so important. And then um, he created this community. And the whole idea is that you were meant to have close relationship with other people. You were meant to open up to other people, to be transparent with other people, you were meant to pray with people, to praise them and be praised, to celebrate and be celebrated, to know and be known, to love and be loved, to laugh with, to cry with, and be transparent. And here's the weird truth. We long for community, but a lot of times we run from it for some odd reason. We're scared to get to that point of being very transparent and open with other people. And so you have to decide what kind of values you're going to have uh, in a community. Are you going to be somebody that reaches out and extends to other people? Or are you going to be one that reaches out just to number one and going it alone and never building good relationships with others in the church or in the community? You have to decide. Are you looking out for number one? Or are you looking out to have community with other people as God intended it to be? So, um, I want to share a little bit about a, a guy that's named Miroslav Volk that's had a book that was entitled Exclusion and Embrace. And in that, he described two ways to look at people. One is people that we could embrace and get close to and have community with, and the other to exclude. To exclude them, to be cold, to be distant with them, to not be there available to them, to shut them out. And I want to give you a metaphor how that works. I want to give you an example. Jim Roberts was visiting, he's a writer that I've read on occasion, was visiting, a high, was visiting his son's high, uh, grade school class, the fourth grade. And that was the day that the teacher was teaching them a new game called the Balloon Stomp. I wonder how many of you ever played the Balloon Stomp. Everybody gets a balloon tied to their ankle, and, and the idea is, the, the, the uh, bottom line is that you want to stomp out everybody else's balloon, and as soon as you stomp them out, then whoever is left is the winner. It's pure Darwin. It's survival of the fittest. 
And so you see some kids that are running around stopping everything in sight, whether it's a balloon or somebody's foot, but they're out there trying to do mass destruction. And there are others that cower in a corner to protect their balloon against anybody else coming to get it. And on and on it goes until all of them are stomped out. And then the idea is somebody won. The winner, the rules are real clear, is the person that's still got the balloon left. So the idea is if you win, I lose. Every time uh, somebody else's balloon gets stomped, I get closer to the top. And so everybody looks out for themselves. Well, then on the heels of that, and then the winner was declared, they had another class come in that was mentally handicapped kids. And Jim Roberts thought, this is kind of disturbing. These kids shouldn't be put through this. I mean, what are they thinking to have them do this balloon stomp, stomp with this highly competitive atmosphere? It's not the way it should work. So the whistle blew. But, and, and they gave them some brief instruction, but in the, in, in, in the, it, when they finished, the kids didn't quite understand what the rules are for winning the game. So instead of going competitive and trying to stomp out everybody else's balloon, they decided to work on a team and stomp all the balloons out together so that everybody could be declared the winner. And so you saw these kids, instead of running around stomping on other kids' balloons, one kid would hold a balloon out. Like a, like a field goal uh, placement person for a kicker, and then the kid would stomp on it, and then they would do it in reverse, and then she would stomp on his, and then they would congratulate each other for the, what they achieved. And they went on and on with this, and, uh, and they did this role reversal. So when the last balloon was, was popped, all the kids applauded, and they cheered. And the reason was, no one was left out. Nobody lost. Everybody won. And in fact, everybody got the job done together. So I want to ask you two questions. Which class got the balloon right and which class got the balloon wrong? That's just one separate question. And the next question, the real question we all must ask is, which game are you and I going to play? The competitive game or are we going to play the one of teamwork? So you can choose one of two ways. You can embrace people, and you can live in community, or you can exclude God and people from your life, and you can go it alone and achieve all you want to achieve. You can acquire all you want to acquire. You can go out and climb the highest mountains and get to the top. And at the end of your life, you discover you're living on an island because you never made any friends. You never developed community. So the thought, I thought of this about, about this a lot. And so I want to share with you today, as the crux of my message, four major choices that we have in cultivating a heart for community. In the time we have left to discuss them, I want to, to, to have you consider in each one of these four categories, do you embrace people or do you exclude people? So they are as follows. Number one, will I accept people as flawed human beings? as I am a flawed human being, or will I pronounce judgment on them and act superior? That's a big one. Secondly, will I enter into competition with people, viewing life as a competitive battle, trying to beat other people and always comparing myself to them, or will I choose to build people up and not make life a comparison deal? Number three, what will I do with my stuff, my things, my time, will I, will I be generous and share with other people, or will I keep it all to myself? Number four, as people come into my life, will I listen and pay attention to them and invite them into my heart, or ignore them and look the other way? So basically, these four, I can kind of, kind of distill them down into four things. Do we judge people, or do we accept them? Do we try to beat people and, and win at every cost, or do we build them? Do we, we withhold from people, or do we share our things? And fourth and not least, do we ignore people, or do we attend to those other people? Number one, I exclude people when I stand in judgment over you. Jesus said it best, very simply, very distinctly, do not judge other people. Don't judge so you won't be judged. And Paul said to the Roman church, who was having a lot of huge problems with a judgmental spirit, he said this. He said, uh, stop judging one another. Accept 
one another as Jesus accepted you. Now, when Jesus said, don't judge others, he wasn't saying that we just accept everybody, carte blanche, all over the world, because there are some people that are pretty mean people and they'll want to do you damage. So he's not saying that. But what he is saying is the kind of judging that Jesus is talking about is that we close our hearts to others, we we, uh, reduce others to a label, and we say things like, you know what? You're not healthy. You're not normal. You're not spiritual. And the implication is, but I am. I'm all of those. And so we run into this, and what gets forgotten in this judgmental spirit is that people adopt this, this attitude of superiority. You know, I'm better than you all. And you can pronounce judgment. By doing that, you feel like you've become superior. Don Shula was the coach of the Miami Dolphins some years ago when they won the Super Bowl, and they didn't lose a game all year. And so he decided with his wife to go up to Maine, a great place, uh, to get away from everything. And they were in some backwoods little town in Maine. It was raining, so they decided to go to a matinee at the theater. And they got there, and when they walked in the theater, of course, he just won the Super Bowl, all of a sudden, a few people, not many, but they all started clapping and cheering. And he looked at his wife smugly, and he said, you know, I can't go anywhere without being recognized. You know, I'm pretty famous now. And then he looked at the person behind him. He said, how did you know me? The person said, am I supposed to know you? He said, well, yeah, you guys were all cheering and clapping when I came in. He said, we were doing that because the theater owner said until we had 10 people, he wasn't going to show the movie. You guys made 9 and 10. And you know, what a humbling experience. And sometimes we need something like that just to be humbled. It's a great story. So I want to say the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all imperfect people. We all serve God. And we're all much loved by God and should be loved by each other. And then, but when you talk about the world, the ground is not level at all. And so people pronounce judgment, they fight, they exclude, and they assume they were superior. Let's never forget that God tells us that each and every one of us were made in the image of God. And as we recognize that, we tend to say, you know, God put you here for a reason too, and I'm going to embrace you, and I'm going to love you. There's no room for superiority then. There's no room for a judgmental attitude then. But when we have this attitude of community, uh, you know, when you have this judgmental attitude, if we have an attitude of community where we embrace people, we accept people, we make them feel welcome, that's what the church is all about. Some of you are parents. And let's face it, there are times that your children disappoint you. Now, you know, do, do you at that point, you know, exclude them? You know, like, you've got to earn my love? Or do you embrace them? Do you say to them, you know, honey, I know, you know, you didn't get what you wanted to, but I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of you, my daughter. I love you. And uh, I'm glad I'm your parent. What happens with somebody that failed in life? Well, you know, in the military, we have promotion boards. And it's really tough when you're on the wrong side of the promotion board and you didn't get selected for the next rank. It's really hard for people to pick up the phone and call you and say something, you know. We, we don't generally uh, gravitate to, to failures, you know. But what about picking the phone up and saying, man, you know, I'm sorry about this, you know. I've been there myself. or I, I failed at something too, but you're a good friend of mine, you know, and I just want to let you know that, uh, that I'm with you. Um, Judging this judging business becomes really serious and it's dangerous for, for uh, religious people. For example, um, you see in the, in, the, in the New Testament that the worst people for judge, judgment, judging other people, were the Pharisees. They were supposed to be the spiritual leaders. They were the, the religious people. They were supposed to be the most spiritually mature people, but in, in, in effect, they were the farthest from God. You know, they were, they were uh, you know, Jesus didn't have a whole lot of positive things to say about them. They, ex- they excluded a lot of folks. Jesus, on the other hand, always was inclusive. You know, who did he pick up to be to befriend? Prostitutes, tax collectors, the poor, little kids. These are all people that, that you know, the others had condemned. And so here he is eating with them. He talked to God, talked about God with them. He spent time with them. He befriended them. And he turned their lives around because of it. So this morning, Jesus sent a strong message to them. How dare you write off people and pronounce judgment on them? In your coldness of heart, you're not able to love God or people. You're farther away from God than people, than the people that you condemn. 
and the people that you exclude. Pretty strong language. So I want you to do a little assessment this morning on that first category that I talked about. Do you find yourself being judgmental with other people a lot? Do you find yourself criticizing other people a lot? Do you find yourself condemning them or acting self-righteous with them? Is it easy to be judgmental with people in your life? It takes, it's time for another approach, including people, loving people, building them up, and, and accepting them as they are. The second point, it's a real difficult one in, in our society. I exclude you when I view life as a kind of competition and you are the opposition. I measure you, I measure you when I try to build you, uh, excuse me, I measure you uh, as opposed to who I am comparing myself to you. I embrace you when I try to build you up. People whose lives are devoted to comparison and competing uh, are, are always looking for conflict uh, in, in, in solving problems with other people. It's not about solving problems. It's not about getting to the right solution. It becomes a field of battle where you're literally trying to impose your will that's stronger than the other person's will. When the other person is talking, you're not listening. What you're doing is thinking about some irrefutable stuff that you can respond to that make you number one. That's the competitiveness game. Competitiveness, not competitiveness game. It's an aspect that is not a good thing. Now, we see that in sports. You know, it's good for the, in, in games like that. But at the end, they're shaking hands. You know, you see a lot of camaraderie. But when you view life, view life as a competition and compare yourself, everybody else, to you, you're saying things like, well, I'm smarter than you. I'm better than you. I'm, I'm prettier than you. I'm, I'm more important than you. I'm more successful than you, you know? And if you can't be any of those, then you're miserable. I heard a story about a Montana rancher, and this guy was always trying to be number one with everybody he encountered, and especially his wife. He was always right. She was always wrong. And so there was a time they were driving home from having dinner, and uh, they pulled up at a stoplight, and there was a squad car right by the, uh, uh, the next lane, and the policeman was looking at him. He didn't have a seatbelt on. And so he said, here, when the light changes, you know, you, draw, you hold the wheel, and I'm going to put my seatbelt on. So when he pulls me over, I can tell him that I was wearing it. And so sure enough, the policeman pulled over and said, sir, I believe I noticed that you weren't wearing your seatbelt. And the man, now having it on, said, oh, sir, I was wearing it the whole time. And in fact, if you don't believe me, ask my wife. She'll tell you I was wearing the seatbelt. The policeman turned to her. He said, was he wearing his seatbelt? She said, I've been married to this man for 20 years, and I know one thing. I never want to argue with him when he's drunk. <laughs> See what happens? So don't compare, you know? Build people up. Don't beat people up because you want to be better than they are. Number three, I embrace community when I share what I have, my resources, my stuff, my time. I close myself off when I try to withhold and protect my stuff. Do you know, there's a lot said about uh, possessions and money in the Bible, particularly the New Testament. Do you know in 16 of Jesus' 18 parables, it talks about money and possessions? One out of every 10 verses in the gospel has to do with money and possessions. There are approximately 500 verses on prayer in the Bible, communicating with God. How important is that? And there are less than 500 talking about faith. There are over 2,000 scriptures in the Bible about money and possessions. We get the impression it's a priority for God, how you handle your stuff. So I embrace community when I share that, that, that stuff I have. I try to withhold it and protect myself, then I'm, I'm, I'm withholding it. I heard a story about a woman who, who was at the airport. True story. And she was waiting for a plane. She got through TSA, so she stopped at one of the little kiosks and she got a bag of chocolate chip cookies. And so now she's rushing to her gate because she had about 15 to 30 minutes to sit there and relax. And so if you've been to the airport many time in the recent past, you know that they've got sweet seats, and every once in a while they have a little table between the seats and then some more seats. And so she sits down, a uh, bag of cookies on the table, and she, she's looking at next to the guy next to her, and he's obviously from India or the Middle East. He's wearing a turban. Uh, 
she realizes he doesn't speak any English. But then uh, she watches, and all of a sudden, he reaches out on the table between them and opens up the bag of chocolate chip cookies. And she's stunned, and he takes one. And she's livid, and so she takes one. And he smiles, and he nods. And then he takes another one. And she takes two, just to prove a point. And he nods, and he smiles. And then he takes two. And this goes on and on until very quickly the bag is emptied. And she is just furious. How dare that guy take my chocolate, chocolate chip cookies? And she gets, finally she's called to the gate, and she gets in line, and she gets her seat, and she opens her, her purse, and there is her bag of chocolate chip cookies. She was eating his cookies, not hers. I mean, you think about it. You know, she's limited because we get so possessive about our stuff. And it was, in, it was his, and he was more than happy to, to, to offer those to her as well. Um, we learn a lot about being real protective of our stuff so that no one makes a preemptive strike. But then you look in comparison at the book of Acts in the early church. There were no barriers there. They shared everything. I mean, they really did. And, and, they, and so there were no walls up between Jews and Gentiles and slave and free and rich and poor. They were all one. They were unified, as we're talking about here today, in the body of Christ. And it obliterated selfishness. They realized something important. You know, they, didn't, they never thought of possessions as their own. They thought of it as something to share with others. And as a result, they thought, I'm only on this earth for a short time, and, and, uh, and I'm a steward of everything that God's given me. You know, I don't, I don't have to try to possess it and keep, keep, keep hold of it. So the questions are, who can benefit from my stuff? Who needs my stuff more than I do? Who has, a, has a, um, a best use for my stuff, a better stuff, better use than I do. You know, I, I even noticed that in, in so many places in suburbia, people park their cars outside. You know why that is? Because their garage is filled with stuff. And so they leave 40, 50, $60,000 cars out in the elements, so they got to protect their stuff that they think they'll need sometime. And it just, you know, it just gets convoluted. It is, why do they do that? Paul Pearsaw writes this, you know. Um, he says, he gives you advice about how to handle stuff. He says, if your problem is too much stuff, go ahead and leave stuff out. Just leave it out for people to see. There's nothing sacred about always putting your stuff away. If you find yourself in a hide-the-stuff panic when there is an unexpected knock at the door, you probably have too much stuff. Oh, no, someone's going to come in and see all my stuff littering this house. Maybe your visitor could take some of your stuff when he or she leaves. It's an idea. Leave your stuff out as a perpetual estate sale for visitors to shop through and take some stuff off your hands. <laughs> Anybody want to sign up for that? <laughs> it's like, you know, I got a question. Are you going to share what you have or are you just going to make life about acquisition? Um, in the world, we count people successful by how much stuff they've collected and how well they hang on to it. Unfortunately, it just goes directly opposed to what the Bible talks about. And so I, I find this really interesting that um, people ask a question when somebody dies and they're doing the funeral, well, how much was he worth? Well, I can tell you what he's worth now, nothing, because he can't take any of it with him, you know? He's left it all here. Alexander the Great had a great... Uh, explanation of what he wanted his troops to do when he died in battle. At the age of 33, he'd conquered the then known world, and he died in battle, but it was a slow death, and before he died, he said, I want you, as the troops file past, to put my body down and lay it in a particular way so that I see my hands being empty to let them know I'm taking none of this with me into the next life. We're just stewards. God gives us stuff for a time, but we leave it all back here. We're just passing through. So what are you going to do with your stuff? Fourth and finally, I exclude you when I ignore you. I embrace you when I pay attention to you. I've been a counselor for over 40 years in the military. Marriages, financial issues, relational issues, job-related issues, people that are going to get, uh, we call it UCMJ, they're going to uh, get some kind of consequences for bad behavior. I want to tell you that uh, and none of them come to me because they want to hear my wise counsel and, and uh, wisdom and advice. I mean, they came 
But you know what they really want? They want to be in the presence of another human being that will actually listen to them, that will, that will pay attention to them, that will look at them and treat them as if they mattered. I was always inclined when I first started counseling, I'd hear you know, the issue, and I'm, I'm problem solving. I'm, I'm running through in my mind how we can fix it or she. And so I jump in and, and, and make this intervention or this intrusion to say, here's what you need to do. Here's three easy steps. And I found out they were not real happy with that, you know, as we were done 10 minutes later. Instead, by letting them talk about their problem, there was a catharsis that took place. There was a eureka moment that took place. And they came to the same conclusion I would have done. And then they're effusive in their praise and thank you, chaplain. You know, I'm glad you helped me see this. But the bottom line is, I let them know they were important to me, that they mattered. People are hungry for that. You can touch and heal many lives just by being an active listener. That's why James said, be quick to listen. Some years ago, my wife went on a conference over the weekend, a Christian conference for women. And so I was in charge of cooking and minding the kids and all that. So I decided to take them out for breakfast to a really health food restaurant. So we went to Krispy Kreme Donuts. Healthy food. High fiber discs, right? They're good. Kids loved it. Never told mom. <laughs> but at any rate, so I'm watching kids eat and pigging out on these Krispy Kreme donuts. I'm enjoying it. And I noticed the booth across from me is a father that took his three or four-year-old daughter. And she's sitting there um, just, you know, wanting to get his attention. He's got a big old newspaper up, and he's reading his newspaper. And she's trying to get his attention in the worst way. So she's taking donut crumbs, and she's throwing them at the paper. Paper, clunk, clunk, clunk. And then she's looking over the side of the paper, and then the other side. And finally, she comes up underneath the paper, and he says, you know, hey, I brought you to the donut shop. What else do you want from me? I can tell her, tell him. She wants you to put down that paper and look at her and listen to her and let her know that she really matters. Whether it's a little kid or adults, it's the same way. People like to know that they're valued, that they matter that you encourage them, just like Barnabas did with, with uh, uh, John Mark. And, and, and so as a general rule, the bottom line is, do we really look at people? Do we see them for who they are? Do we extend ourselves? God longs for people that instead of excluding them, embrace them. Let them know they matter. Share our stuff with them. Don't judge them, but accept them. Don't beat on them to try to beat them in competition, but build them. That's the heart of God. And the bottom line is, we must choose. Are we going to exclude people? Or are we going to embrace them? Let's pray. Father, this morning I pray that uh, these words, these humble words, would speak to all of us about how we can do better in this area of community. We have a hurting world out there. Father, we have people that are, are really uh, struggling with this pandemic. They're hunkered down. They're locked down. Um, they're living in fear. Oh, how they need to hear someone, one of us, talk not only about how we care about them, but God himself, but God, you yourself care about them, so much so that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for them so that he could have, you could have eternal fellowship with them. Help us to apply this in our lives, to look at people differently in a way of embracing and not exclusion. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.